Pickpockets and how to protect your data. The top three ways to keep your shards slotted and secure. Are you reading this on the street? In a store? In the metro? When was the last time you checked your neural sockets? The pickpocket plague is worse than it's ever been. The NCPD received hundreds of complaints in the last cycle from residents who reported having shards stolen from their neural sockets. How can you protect yourself? We've got you covered. Thefts largely go uninvestigated due to the police's prioritization of violent crime, which has left pickpockets feeling increasingly bold. Exploits used to hack our neuralware are widely available on the black market, so many thieves have shifted focus from our pockets to our sockets. One brief moment of inattention and your private information is flying from your neck into someone's sticky fingers. The NCPD admits tracking such thieves is difficult and a waste of resources, which is why we're here to help you in which is why we're here to help keep your info safe with three options to suit any budget. One, change your settings to ensure you receive notifications any time a shard is removed from a neural port. Unfortunately, this approach leads to a high number of false positives when you're fiddling with your own neuralware. Number two, invest in new sockets. Several new models on the market already have built-in safety and authorization measures to keep shards locked in tight. But if you're pinching every any, this solution could break the bank. And last but not least, number three, duct tape. Slap on a square of that and those shards aren't going anywhere. On a budget, bad with tech, no regard for style, then this is the option for you. emergency on demand. How did it happen? When and why did we as a society decide that human life is a commodity, a luxury? My mother passed away at 45. She still had decades of life to live until it was all stolen from her by common pneumonia. If she had even the cheapest trauma team policy, she could have been cured within an hour, but she couldn't afford it. My mother died five months before her scheduled appointment with our family practitioner. The idea of privatized healthcare is deeply ingrained in our public psyche. Already in 2020, there was a widespread consensus that 500 euro dollars a month was a fair price for trauma team insurance. Health wasn't something you were given, it was something you earned. The private system may not be perfect, but there's no alternative, we thought. Now across the Pacific Ocean to the USSR, where they have highly trained medical technicians, high precision nanosurgical suites, specialized antibodies, intravenous probes, the list goes on. Emergency airlifts using modern AVs equipped with cryotonic chambers? They have those too. The difference then? They don't leave their people to die on the streets, at the store, in their homes. They don't force anyone to purchase their lives from a corporation as if they're the ones who own it. Public health care isn't some unachievable utopia. It is a reality. Trauma Team, on the other hand, treats its policyholders as both potential patients to be treated and potential products to be bought. They save lives only because there is profit in it. A saved life is a returning customer. Client death can also bring in fiscal gains in the form of organ and implant resale, though of course in regulated smaller sums. An emergency care provider can't afford to give its managers reasons to deliberately kill off its clientele base for short-term windfalls. Surely you ask, these medical professionals are also guided by their Hippocratic oaths? Please. Buddhism and cyberware, a perspective. For most of us, the precepts of Buddhism seem baffling to say the least. How would you explain to the average night citizen why bhikkhus such as yourself are against implanting cybernetic technology into their bodies? It's not that we're against them per se. Every person has the right to make choices with their bodies so long as those choices don't harm another. Although bhikkhu do abide by stricter rules, such as abstaining from cyberware in order to achieve enlightenment. Then what does your hesitation stem from? How do cybernetics affect your pursuit of enlightenment? Well, among other things, it's their vague fluid status. For lack of a better word, ask yourself, uh, what is an implant? A part of your body? An impersonal object? You're asking me, uh, uh, suppose I'd say it depends. Precisely. Biku limit their possessions to a robe, umbrella, and a bowl for alms. Everything else is a distraction that hinders his or her release from the world's suffering. 
Let's say, for example, that a synthetic hand is just that. A hand, a part of your body. But if it has a watch installed in it? A blade? Right, I think I understand. Where the line's drawn isn't completely clear. Possessions, especially such intimate ones, are distractions that muddy the mind, that pull it further from inner peace. I believe the phenomenon of cyberpsychosis is proof enough of this.
and received. Textbook example of a job well done, don't you think? A plus plus. Contract closed. <laughs>